yourself and say, oh, a squirrel, a rat, a pigeon. But what we found is that New York City is actually a lot more diverse than this. We have the American beaver, the American goldfinch, and the American jet, just to name a few. But why should anyone care about this kind of diversity? Well, for one thing, humans like nature. They like being outside, they like being around greenery. In addition, biodiversity helps to give a unique character to a city. Not every animal species and every plant species is found in every city in the world. And so the unique nature outside of the city comes to play inside the city. Another reason is to improve the human nature relationship. A lot of times in urban areas, people forget that they are surrounded by nature and that just because you live in an urban space doesn't mean that it's not natural. Lastly, today 81% of Americans live in urban spaces. They only represent 2% of the surface area, but we use 75% of the resources. So the question becomes, what is an urban environment? And they face a variety of factors, one of which is altered biogeochemical cycles. They have increased pollutants, increased nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon. They also suffer from the urban heat island effect because of the abundance of impervious surfaces from roads and buildings. They also suffer from patch fragmentation. They may have parks, but these are largely cut up because of the impervious surface area. And altered hydrological cycles, as we learned from some of the other capstone groups. There may be ponds or rivers, but these are largely altered by human influence. So what do we already know about the biodiversity of New York City? Well, for one thing, we know that New York City was once remarkably diverse, and we know this through a project, um, the Manhattan Project, which was done through the Wildlife Conservation Society. We also know that all urbanization alters the species composition of cities and communities. So when urban development tends to happen, sometimes this can change the species that live in an urban area from what was once there. But we've learned that cities are still relatively native. They have native plants and native species of animals. So what is the Lalikia project, which is a part of the project that we worked on? It goes beyond the Manahata project that I mentioned before to encompass all five boroughs and the seascape to look at the types of ecology that we have today, compare it to the past, to see what we can learn from this. <clears throat> OK, so what exactly did we do this semester? Well, we set out to create a comprehensive database that would list all of the wildlife and preserves in New York City and New York City. Um, and we did this by reading through all of the peer, most of the peer-reviewed published literature that's been done in the city, um, include books, scientific journals, articles, newspaper articles, reports, maps, surveys, um, to come up with a total of 3,300 events. Um, an event is a unique dimension of a specific species at a time and location. For every single event, we input it into a web-enabled web Postgres database, um, which looks somewhat like this. And uh, essentially, each one of us could contribute to it. Um, and we would further specify the species the specific locality type, which we could input using this geo tool, um, and the evidence, event, and survey type. So that would include whether it was a first-hand event, second-hand observation, um, a trapping event, and so as Jesse said, we recorded nearly 3,300 events over the course of about 470 years, and this graph illustrates these events over time. Um, and one of the earliest events we noted was in 1626, and it was a sighting of a beaver in Manhattan. Um, and one of the most recent events was in 2012, a sighting of a deer in Queens. And you'll notice this very high peak in the graph, and that was in 1996, and it was a sighting of over 300 bird species um, in Jamaica Bay Park. And you'll also notice that a majority of events are located, are, have occurred after 1900. Um, and this is due to a couple of things. So first, um, there's been a greater interest and initiative in recording species after this time. Uh, second, records have been better kept and managed, and even published uh, in scientific journals. And lastly, um, among the resources that we used, a lot of them were um, large books and databases with the wealth of events that really impacted the peaks that you see here in this graph. Now these series of graphs um, essentially represent the same information except differentiated by taxa. Um, and you'll notice while the x-axis or the years remain the same, the y-axis does float for each graph. So just to take you through it from the top, we have in green fish events, bird events, mammal events, and amphibian and reptile events. And it's really interesting to notice the patterns among the different taxa. So in the top in green, the fish events, they're pretty significant and strong in the 1800s and 2000s, 
but dip low in between that time, which coincided with the time of overexploitation of the fish in New York City. And then going down one notch, the birds in orange, um, they're very strong, consistent, but again, only after 1900. And the mammal events in purple, while they did uh, really represent the gamut of years that we studied, uh, there are significant gaps in between. And lastly, the amphibians and reptiles uh, were slightly underrepresented in this study and very sparse, but again, mostly after 1900. All right, so here we have the percent of species that are native and that are introduced. So as you can see, the majority of them are native, um, with amphibians having the highest at 100% native. Um, fish have the most introduced at about 16%, but that's still their fairly high native percent. And for the total, it was 93% native. And here we have our species richness by taxa. So basically, species richness is the number of different species. So birds have the most at 392, or about 50% of all those species that were observed. Fish came second with about 31%. Um, mammals was third at about 10%, and amphibians and reptiles was the least with about 3% each. And this is just, this is New York City. Um, with the species richness distri um, distribution across the five boroughs and the seascape. So the first figure is the species richness, and the second figure in parentheses is the number of events. So for Queens, which had the most of both, you see the species richness was 419 with 1,076 events. And after, um, second to Queens was the seascape with the most. After that was the Bronx, then Manhattan, Brooklyn, and then Staten Island. So as you can see from uh, this graph, which kind of plays off of the past, uh, the last image that you saw, um, a, great, a greater emphasis was placed on uh, the resources that we use on the tax of birds as compared to you know, fish, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. And we think that that's primarily due to the diligence that bird watchers generally put into uh, ob observations of species in the, within the five boroughs. Um, and then, as you can also see, Queens, the borough of Queens had the most uh, recorded events as well. And we believe that that is due to the fact that uh, the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge is located there, and a greater emphasis was placed on collecting data and species observations in that locality. Um, and as well, you can see in this next uh, graphical representation of species by taxa across boroughs. This graph looks pretty much identical to the previous graph, except for changes in the y-axis. And that basically shows how the amount of effort placed um, in observing these species kind of reflected the different, the species richness that we found across the taxes and across boroughs. So if for future reference or future um, data collection, we would like to focus more on collecting data on mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and fish to better represent the actual uh, amount of species diversity across these boroughs. Because as we found, our data was slightly skewed by the um, increases in the amount of birds uh, observed, as well as the uh, large amount of events found in Queens. When you look at breakdowns, like the ones we've been showing you, especially the ones that show changes in trends over time, it's important to understand exactly what kind data we're dealing with. So we coded our data into three categories. The first, most simple, is quantitative data. That's usually a scientific study where somebody sees something like 39 goldfinches or 12 nests within a certain locale. The second kind of data that we dealt with is qualitative data. So in those cases, we get a description rather than a number. So something like this kind of animal is rare in this area, or common, or not uncommon, uh, and those are hard to quantify. Um, the third kind of data we have is presence data, so somebody noting that a species exists within a certain area, but not necessarily giving us a sense of how common or uncommon they are. So that's a lot of lists where we see, like, here are 15 birds that are commonly seen in Central Park. Um, and as you can see, those three kinds of data break down approximately equally within our research. Uh, quantitative data is slightly more common than the other two. So now we're just going to give you a little taste into specific species. 
So one of the species that we observed was the great egret. And throughout the 1800s, the great egret was a local resident to the New York City area. But in the 1900s, it was hunted to local extinction by the millinery trade, which is the women's hat trade. In 1910, a group of New York City women decided to boycott the trend of feathered hats. And this created a worldwide um, trend against these feathered hats. And in 1910, local laws in New York City ban the hunting of these birds. And as you can see by the graph of our observations that we collected, uh, great egrets have been on the rise, especially since the late 1990s, early 2000s, when Jamaica Bay was really established as a location for the protection of these types of species. Uh, next up, we're going to look at the striped bass. Um, striped bass is very common in the New York area. Um, it has a long history of both commercial and recreational fishing. Um, there was a collapse of the fish stock in the 1980s, uh, which led to the Atlantic Striped Bass Conservation Act, which passed. Um, this has led to the, uh, the increase in the number of fish found in our city and has shown a, a successful story of conservation practices. And one of the mammalian species we want to point out is the North American beaver. As you may know, the North American beaver was is on the New York Seal and was one of the main reasons that the Dutch first traveled to New York, to New York City. Um, 